Good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Apologies for the five minutes delay. Uh, we were just waiting for more attendees to join the webinar, but we can, we can start now. Today's presentation, co-hosted by Oxford and the John Loon Law Firm, will introduce the new foreign investment law that came into force in China on 1st January 2020. In the first part, Quentin Bottasso, legal consultant for John Loon Law Firm, will present the new foreign investment law and China's negative list as well as the major changes and opportunities for Sino foreign joint ventures. In the second part, I will discuss from a financial perspective, the importance of implementing control mechanisms and uh, the most common mistakes done by foreign enterprises engaging in uh, joint ventures in China. Quentin, um, I leave the floor to you. All right. Um, oops, all right, okay, here we go. Good morning, everybody um, who are watching from Europe. Good afternoon from everybody watching from China. Uh, I would like to start by thanking uh, Cindy, Katerina, Francesca for making this um, this webinar possible. Thanks to all attendees for coming um, and making this uh, this this event uh, this event as successful as as possible. Um, my hope is that everybody will learn a great deal through this uh, the next hour that we're going to spend together. I will try to make this presentation as insightful as I can by um, uh, putting myself in the audience's shoes. This means that I will try to, um, to to make it practical and not to lose myself into too many details that are not serving the purpose of making it clear uh, what are the consequences of the new foreign investment law for, uh, for joint ventures, as well as um, maybe provide some insights to legal or uh, accounting professionals that are in the audience as well. Um, Okay, I will. Um, in this webinar, we will be covering um, basically uh, the impacts, um, negative and positive, of the foreign investment law, the new foreign investment law that has been enacted and uh, implemented since the 1st January of 2020. Um, so this should give you a good overview of, of, uh, of how to adapt uh, to the new changes. Regarding Jonglun Law Firm that I that I am representing today, um, well, we have uh, 18 offices uh, across the globe, 11 offices in China, uh, and also Hong Kong, uh, SAR, Tokyo, London, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and a newly opened office in Almaty, Kazakhstan. Uh, I'm working myself uh, from the Guangzhou office, covering the Guangdong, Fujian, Hunan, and Guangxi provinces. Um, but we uh, have the means and local resources to handle cases all over China. Um, the scope of practices that I cover include corporate law, which is basically incorporations, deregistrations, and liquidations. Uh, also contract laws, employment matters, intellectual property, uh, commercial litigations and cross-border transactions of any kind. You will find my uh, email address uh, on this slide, as well as two QR codes. The one on the left is my personal one, and the one on the right is uh, Jung Lun's, um, let's say, um, public account. You can feel free to add me if you have any questions, and you can feel free to add uh, the Jung Lun, um QR code, well, official account for uh, regular updates, legal updates, articles that are mostly in Chinese. So keep this in mind. All right, let's start now. Okay. Okay, so this is the agenda that we'll be covering today. Introduction, part one, understanding China's negative list. This, uh, this part will be a little bit shorter than the other one. The other one will be covering 
uh, all the most important aspects of the new law. Um, and concluding remarks, and then I will hand over my uh, my microphone to to Francesca. Okay. Um, introduction to the new foreign investment law and key impacts. Adopted on March 15, uh, 2019, and became effective on 1st January 2020. So this is uh, basically a law that has been pushed by uh, the, well, indirectly, but still pushed by the US-China trade war. Um, and China has been uh, has been enacted this law very quickly after, uh, as you can see, after, after adopting it. This law, okay, so this is on the technical aspect of things. This law will replace three currently, uh, well, previously effective laws uh, under uh, under the, the previous legal regime: Sino Foreign Equity Joint Venture Law, Sino Foreign Cooperative Joint Venture Law, and Wholly Foreign Owned Enterprise Law. So basically, we had three pieces of legislation before that would um, that would organize all of those matters for equity joint ventures, cooperative joint ventures, and wholly foreign owned enterprises. This new law that is uh, a national uh, law will actually cover those three topics uh, and, and, and replace, uh, replace those. Okay, so um, basically one of the key elements of the law is that the Chinese legislator tried to give uh, basically foreign um, and domestic companies an equal treatment, equal uh, footing, let's say. Um, keep in mind that once, uh, when the law was adopted, the legislator uh, stated that there will be a five-year transition period from when the, uh, the law became effective to when all companies should comply with the law, meaning between the 1st January 2020 and the 31st December 2024, this is the period we call the transition period. Old companies operating under the older system will have the five-year period to adapt, and the legislator said that during, uh, during this five-year period, three types of operations shouldn't be affected. Asset transfer, so asset transfer, what I'm talking about, uh, asset transfer, profit distribution, and asset distribution here, I mean that things that are now considered unlawful will be tolerated during this five-year transition period. Here we are talking about the five keys impact, five key impacts on Sino foreign equity joint ventures um, and cooperative joint ventures. Uh, basically this is what we're going to cover today, reporting systems and new requirements, changes in corporate governance, profit sharing, foreign loans and IP right protection. Okay, so a quick uh, quick word on the two types of joint venture under the China laws. We have equity joint ventures and cooperative joint ventures. Uh, in China, basically, gener generally speaking, a joint venture is a private company that, it o that is owned by two or more shareholders in order to serve a purpose. Shareholders will like, allocate their resources in order to serve this specific purpose. The equity joint venture, which is the most common form of joint venture, is a Chinese limited liability company under the law. The cooperative joint venture is not necessarily a separate legal entity with its own legal personality. This is to say that um, the, corporate, the cooperative joint venture is not, doesn't uh, necessarily enjoy the right of a separate entity under the law. Generally speaking, uh, cooperative joint ventures is a system that allows for more flexibility and more freedom for the parties in their arrangement. Uh, for instance, party can agree to disconnect profit and losses uh, to the shareholder split or percentages. Also, there is one important aspect to understand uh, regarding cooperative joint ventures. Um, here we have uh, well, basically, if one companies, if, if one of the two companies within the joint venture is committing a breach of contract, um, either 
for either regarding the Articles of Association or a previously agreed shareholder agreement, um, one one other party can withdraw from the uh, from the uh, cooperative joint venture. So you see, it's, it's it's a more flexible system in the sense that it doesn't engage companies as much as uh, the equity joint venture. Okay, so um, more more general uh, provisions on uh, joint venture. Basically, basically speaking, a joint venture is um, is a structure that has its own risks and benefits. I would like you to have all of us consider joint ventures as something else than the last and only recourse to access a market that is restricted to foreign investors under the negative list, as we're going to discuss later on. Um, basically, it has been uh, considered over the past years that joint ventures is the last resort for companies when they cannot enter the market under the wholly foreign owned uh, enterprise system. It's true that this has been the case over the past years, although joint ventures are not limited to this uh, last resort uh, option that we see. I would like you to consider a few other options where joint ventures have a, a decisive, uh, let's say, um, it's, let's say a, it's, a, it's a better arrangement in some situations. Let me give you a few examples and, and I would like you to consider those. First one, joining a Chinese partner can allow for faster and more efficient distribution of your products or services and constitutes a lower barrier to entrance into the Chinese market. This is uh, very often uh, forgot by, by foreign investors. Foreign entities can obviously leverage the resources uh, of a Chinese partner that is well established in the Chinese market. Those resources do include, for instance, uh, already existing clientele, cultural understanding, which is very important in the Chinese market, as you know, uh, and general understanding of the market as well. Um, we also have, we can also mention language, uh, language abilities, especially in uh, local languages, and also a, a, an already existing network of partners, which include suppliers, uh, customs, freight forwarder, local government uh, for seeking guidance, and so on. Basically, what I'm trying to say here is that when you uh, enter into a joint venture, you can leverage uh, the resources of a Chinese partner that you wouldn't be able to access otherwise if you would consider entering the market by yourself. Another uh, point I would like to raise here is that um, strong Chinese market players are keen more and more over the years to benefit from a foreign investor's brand, technology, or management experience. Uh, the, the asset that a foreign uh, company has can be cultivated within a Wufi. This is in most cases possible, but again, it may be uh, it may produce more dividends uh, if those resources are leveraged within a bigger structure. That is to say, uh, partnering with a Chinese company and putting those resources in common. So this is also something that needs to be considered uh, from a business uh, point of view. Also, uh, another uh, another thing that can be uh, very unique to to joint ventures is that uh, we see in our practice that some assets are very difficult to acquire for foreign investors, such as licenses or land, for instance. Um, partnering into a joint venture with a, with, a Chinese, with a Chinese partner can allow you uh, more access, at least, well, um, not necessarily guaranteed, but, but a much, much easier access to those, uh, to those uh, assets. Equally speaking, um, partnering with a Chinese state-owned enterprise can allow for a better, much better access to public markets. Also, in merger and acquisition deals, um, this is something that we see more and more, especially in bigger deals. When a foreign, uh, for instance, equity funds is trying to acquire a big Chinese target, the due diligence may provide um, some good enough conclusions for the foreign investor to uh, 
to decide him to move forward on the acquisition. Now, this said, a due diligence is not, is not uh, let's say, magic in the sense that the foreign investor does not really know what he acquires until he actually uh, operates the company. Maybe uh, some of you have experience in this. You acquire a target, the due diligence report doesn't show any uh, issues, and then you start operating the company and then you discover that some things couldn't be uh, highlighted by the due diligence and uh, issues are arising uh, later on. In order to avoid those uh, kind of um, very late realizations, uh, it is it is something to be considered to uh, to agree on a partial asset acquisition first. Let's say instead of acquiring 100% of the shares of a, of, a, of a Chinese company, you can agree to acquire let's say 20% in the first stage, and then in the second phase, uh, you can agree to convert the Chinese company into a joint venture. Uh, at this point, you will be able to uh, operate the company for quite a while and, and have a much better understanding of what is actually going on within the company. And then it can be a good, uh, a good in intermediary step um, for you to assess the acquisition again with a much better understanding and decide to move forward or, um, or uh, actually sell your asset and, and get out of the deal. So this, uh, th this uh, the joint venture within a merger and acquisition context is uh, something that is a very powerful tool that is not always leveraged and should be considered more often in my uh, in my opinion okay now we are covering part one understanding china's negative uh, list system this okay i'm trying to be i'm trying to be uh, clear here but not uh, not too much into the details Basically speaking, foreign investment is limited into China. You cannot access the Chinese market freely. Um, although we are seeing a, uh, an opening up in the last uh, years, over the, over the course of decades, it's much, it's much more clear. But over the past years, we see some uh, major improvements, I would say, in the uh, market uh, access for foreign investors. Of course, the Chinese situation cannot be compared to uh, the Western legal regimes in the sense that limitations are more stringent on foreign investment compared to uh, those in the West. China has been a planned economy uh, for a long time, and we can see signs of, of those uh, old, let's say, uh, let's say system and, and, uh, and regime. The government there is basically four lists that limit investment in China. Those lists are very often at time uh, updated, so it's important to keep an eye on them. Sometimes you see articles passing by saying uh, new uh, industries that are not restricted anymore, and this is the kind of list I'm talking about. There's four lists, as I just said. The number one is the special administ administrative measures on access to foreign investors. So this is what we generally call the negative list. The last version has been updated in June 2020. Um, the last version is comprised of a list of 30 restrictions. Keep in mind that now we are at the number of 30 in 2017. So not a long time ago, it was 63. So we, in three years, we divided by two the number of uh, restrictions or restricted industries within China for uh, foreign investment. Also, we have the general negative list. This negative list applies to all companies in China, including Chinese companies, of course. These, this list simply says that you cannot access some aspects of the economy. So this doesn't uh, doesn't limit itself to foreign investment. This is for all type of investments. We also have the free trade zone, special administrative measures on access to foreign investment. So this is again for free trade zones specifically and the catalog for guiding industry restructuring. For the sake of this presentation, it is not really relevant to cover the general negative list, which does apply to, again, all companies in China, same as the free trade zone negative list that is only applicable as the name uh, points at in free trade zones. As for the catalog for guiding industry restructuring, the last one, 
this catalog is basically uh, is basically a tool for the local government to push for improvement of the Chinese economical system through promoting some industries and limit or phase out some other industries that are considered uh, basically backwards in the sense that they are harmful for the economy or the people, polluting, not necessary to the Chinese economy and so on. So we'll not cover those uh, further, those last three further, we'll be focusing on, on the, the first one. Okay, so basically, when we advise investors into the China market entry, uh, or this is, well, I'm talking here about greenfield, in, greenfield investment, or company acquisitions uh, in an M&A deal, or business expansion for those who are already in the market, let's say a woofie that would like to start pursuing another type of business. What we do basically is we try to ask questions to understand as much as we can the scope of business they're going to cover and what kind of activities they're going to uh, to conduct into China in order to understand if they fall under the, the negative list or not. Through this type of analysis, we can basically draw the borders of the business so that it does not fall under the foreign investment negative list. Um, let's say if you if you produce auto parts, you don't fall under the negative list, but if you produce the whole car, you start to uh, you start to fall under the, the the restricted areas. So this is just a basic example. Uh, it's more clear on technology companies where the line is usually very blur and we basically uh, often advise investors to be very aware of what is permitted and what is not and draw a clear border between between uh, the okay side and the not so okay side. For generally speaking for businesses that are not uh, listed in the foreign investment negative list they can decide to set up either a woofy so a company that is that is only uh, wholly owned by a foreign investor, foreign investor, or foreign investors, or a GV. So it's possible to uh, to set up a GV for a business that is not uh, under the negative list. This is something something that could that should be kept in mind. People usually equal joint ventures with uh, restricted areas. But you can set up a joint venture to conduct uh, businesses that are uh, permitted under WUFI. As I said, you can leverage the resources of a local partner and so on. So this is also something that needs to be considered. Um, for businesses that are restricted, what you need to understand is that a company owned solely by a foreign investor, so a WUFI, will not be able to operate. The two options that uh, the, investor, the investor is faced with now are number one, enter into a joint venture with a Chinese partner according to the rules um, set forth in the uh, negative list. The second option is set up a variable entity, uh, variable interest entity, what we call the VIE structure. It must be noted that um, restricted industry must obtain prior approval from local authorities. I will also, uh, I will also cover a few, uh, a well, basically say a quick word about variable interest entities. VIEs are basically a contractual arrangement uh, that is on top of a company structure that allows for indirect control of companies uh, in China. Basically, here we have, uh, we have the outside China side that is basically, um, that is basically the actual controller of the company. We have the inside China side. Um, we have a few companies and we have contractual arrangements so that the actual company that that is the forefront of, uh, of the business is actually controlled by uh, outside partners, except they don't appear anywhere. So basically, this is a, um, this is a creation from lawyers that have uh, face the problem of entering the Chinese market without entering into a joint venture. Problem is, VIE structure is a very uh, fragile, let's say, system. 
we see more and more issues that uh, that are going to be faced with the IE structure. I'm not saying that it's the end of the IE structures, but I'm saying it's going to be more and more difficult over the years. And at any point, the government can say, okay, stop this. Uh, the IE structures are not tolerated anymore. And, and uh, this is a very big risk on companies that are operating under this kind of regime. Um, again, foreign investment law, article number two is very clear on this in the sense that uh, it is made quite clear that foreign investment include investment made by foreign investors in China through other means. Other means can be understood as via structures, obviously. Also, as we'll see later on, you, you have more uh, strict requirements in uh, regarding reporting of who is the actual controller of the company, which which makes it harder for via structures to operate in China with a peace of mind. Okay, now moving on to part number two, major changes and opportunities for Sino foreign invested joint ventures. This is the actual uh, this is the actual heart of the presentation and where most uh, aspects will be covered and probably where you will be the most interested in uh, in uh, gaining knowledge. Number one, reporting requirements. Number two, changes in corporate governance. Number three, changes in profit sharing. Number four, foreign loans. Number five, technology and licensing agreements. So we'll be covering those one by one. Reporting requirements, number one. After an analysis of the uh, intended business of the joint venture will be involved in the foreign investment law, uh, we should have a look at the article number 34 that you can read on the screen. The state shall establish a foreign investment information reporting system. Basically, um, reporting is not new, but the regime of the reporting is uh, is new under this new foreign investment law. After the establishment into China, among others, foreign invested enterprises, uh, which uh, which includes WUFIs and also representative offices, must report some information to the Ministry of Commerce, the MOFCOM, and the State Administration for Foreign Market for Market Reg Regulation, the SAMR and uh, what we call SAFE, which is the State Administration of Foreign Exchange, which is basically the authority that is in charge of uh, agreeing on uh, current currency exchange within and outside of China. Okay, the information that will need to be uh, submitted is, uh, we basically have three big categories of, uh, of submission, what we call the initial report, the change report and the annual report. The initial report is basically uh, is basically um, the duty for companies to publish when a new company is established, uh, when a subsidiary of a Chinese entity is established, when there is an acquisition deal with uh, with a with a Chinese entity involved. Again, change report. Similarly, um, this covers a change of the uh, the above. What I'm what I'm saying by by that is that uh, when a when a when a new company is established, um, it will have to 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 report initially. Uh, again, future changes will have to be included in a, in a change report. Um, also, so this has been uh, this has been uh, clarified later on by uh, by the authorities in implementation implementation rules. Register, registered capital alterations must be must be reported, meaning if you increase or lower the the, um, uh, the social capital of a company, you will have to report this. Relocating your uh, your company is also something that needs to be reported. The change uh, of the board of directors and uh, shareholders uh, meeting and also the change of shareholder structure. All of those, um, let's say, events in a company's life must be reported under this new uh, foreign investment law. There is a, a platform that um, that is basically centralizing all of those, uh, all of those reports. This is the online enterprise registration, registration system. And there is also an annual report between the 1st January and 30 
30th of June of each year uh, on the National Enterprise Credit Information Publicity System. So those are the new uh, the new report uh, reporting requirements for companies within China, which again includes uh, WUFIs and representative offices. Last point and probably the most important one in my in my point of view, it will be required to report who is the actual person controlling the foreign invested enterprise. Again, this is applicable to representative offices, WUFIs, and every type of joint venture. The new foreign investment law is now stricter on the understanding of who is the actual person controlling the company because uh, it is now understood that the person controlling the company is either someone with 50% of the voting powers of the shares or other similar rights, or also someone that has less than 50% of, of the voting power, shares or similar rights, but is in control due to uh, actually controlling the board of directors or have actual influence through contractual or material arrangements. This means that um, it's much harder to hide under a uh, contractual or material structure that would uh, that would um, actually um, make it so that it's hard to, to understand who is the actual controller. Also, there's a big issue with uh, complex structures because um, because in a very complex structure, it's it's really hard to point at the actual controller because there is always multiple controllers. So it, it it's simply much harder for for companies with a complex with a complex uh, corporate structure to actually do this reporting. Um, and also, again, as I mentioned before, it creates a big um, issue on variable uh, interest entities via e structures, as I said before. Um, please note that fines for uh, not reporting are, are quite steep and uh, that reporting is, uh, is something mandatory for every company in China. Point number two, changes in corporate governance. Um, before the new foreign investment law, the equity joint venture and cooperative joint venture laws stated that the highest decision-making authority was the board of directors. So this is the previous system. Meanwhile, the company law uh, that is regulating WUFIs, just like uh, exactly like it's the case for Chinese limited liability companies, uh, it's the shareholder general meeting that is actually in control of the company. Under the new law, uh, equity joint ventures and cooperative joint ventures will now uh, rejoin the regime of, um, of the company law, which is basically the shareholder general meeting is the highest authority within the company. Now keep in mind that decisions in a joint venture must be taken jointly, uh, which is a big issue for foreign investors when they have to enter into a joint venture. Uh, it's like a, it's like a car that is driven with two hands on the steering wheel, except it's not the two hands belonging to one person. It's one hand for the Chinese party and one hand for the uh, for the foreign investor, which which makes it hard when you have an obstacle in front of you and and uh, one wants to go left and the other one wants to go right, as you can imagine. Um, okay, again, um, again. This is the summary of the changes under the, the uh, new system. Any existing joint venture, either cooperative or equity joint venture, will need to review the joint venture contracts and article of association. There's a few things that uh, we can do in order to take advantage of the new changes of the law within the five year period, which is basically between 2020 and the end of 2024. Number one, revise the decision-making authority and voting mechanism accordingly. So articles of association and shareholder agreements that have been entered into by foreign invested enterprises under the previous system are now contrary to the law. They will be tolerated under the, the, the five-year period, the transition, transition period, but there is no, uh, in my opinion, no uh, benefit in waiting for the five-year period to expire before negotiating um, new terms. 
because the new law is more favorable for foreign invested enterprises. So um, basically, let's take advantage of of the new uh, of the new law. Under the current provisions, a shareholder of an equity joint venture having two thirds of the voting rights um, is actually in uh, control of the company in the sense that they can uh, enact major decisions. Major decisions here include amending the article of Articles of Association, which uh, cover a lot of, uh, of uh, issues themselves. You can also dissolve the uh, equity joint venture, change the equity joint venture's social capital, split the equity joint venture, uh, agree on a merger or uh, uh, another type of uh, M&A deal with, uh, with another party. Previously, those very important changes in the company, uh, in, in the joint venture, were submitted uh, to the well, were subject to unanimous decision from the board of directors. Under the new law, it's not the case anymore. Again, two thirds of the shareholding uh, under one hand allows for almost total control. So I'll uh, also be uh, sharing those kind of changes that you can uh, see on your screen under the foreign investment law and before the foreign investment law. So as you can see, the uh, important decisions were subject to uh, anonymous decision for, uh, from all directors before before the law, and now a shareholder representing two thirds of more of uh, or more of voting, voting rights can actually do pretty much everything. Now we'll be um, now we'll be covering uh, the profit allocation uh, part of the presentation. This is quite straightforward. Basically, uh, distribution of dividends are normally distributed between shareholders of a joint venture based on their shareholding split, meaning if you have 50% of the shares of a joint venture, you will be entitled to have 50% of the dividends. Um, under the new Article 30, well, the newly applicable Article 34 of the China Company Law, it is now possible to uh, agree on another mechanism. It is possible. In other words, to decorrelate um, dividends from the actual paid-in capital contribution for each shareholder, meaning you can own 20% of the shares, but actually uh, receiving 60, 70, 80% of the dividends. Now, keep in mind that uh, we need to be cautious on two levels here. This is also applicable to what I said about uh, about uh, here. Uh, Company, uh, company structure and the highest uh, authority. Um, because in foreign invested joint ventures, you have to publish the article of association and uh, potentially shareholder agreements, um, and those need to be approved by local authorities. They, there might be some, um, how to say, they will be not very keen to agree uh, on having a foreign investor uh, gaining so much right against their Chinese counterparty. So this should be uh, taken with a pinch of salt on the on the regulation side and also on the business side. Um, it's really hard uh, for a uh, for a Chinese uh, partner in a joint venture to be told that um, now you have uh, much more right than 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 he does. And also, this is subject to uh, to business negotiation. So the law allows for it. I'm not saying it's going to be the case in any in any uh, joint venture because again, there is the um, the compliance side uh, regarding the law and the business aspect of things that needs to be taken into account. A quick word on foreign loans because it's a very uh, very specific topic. It's almost a, a technician topic. It's almost an engineering topic uh, for uh, financial uh, financial engineers. Basically, here the foreign uh, the new foreign investment law organizes two regimes for companies to obtain uh, and and uh, 
receive loans from uh, from abroad, subject to the approval of the SAFE, the SAFE. Basically, you have two um, two models. That I'm not going to get very deep into this. The debt equity borrowing gap model and the full coverage model that are uh, going to determine the capacity for a foreign invested enterprise to be granted loans from abroad. Just keep in mind, if you are in the situation and you need more guidance, you can directly send me an email and, and we can discuss this in further details. It's very technical. It's, well, I'm not going to get much much deeper into those details otherwise we'll be uh we'll be losing uh, we'll be losing people here um for no uh, for no reason last point number five improvements to uh to rules on technology licensing by foreign foreign licenses okay ip rights in china are protected under three bodies of law Number one, Chinese national laws. Number two, bilateral investment treaties and um, and basically international law, number three. Now, to be a little bit technical here, for a licensing agreement between a foreign invested enterprise in China and a Chinese domestic company in China, only national laws will apply because there's no international element. What I just said is that there are three laws that apply to um, to licensing agreement and technology uh, and technology intensive agreements. Number one is Chinese national law, and number two and number three are bilateral investment treaties and the World Trade Organization, uh, which basically takes the form of technology import and export regulation, which we what we call PR, and uh, and trade related aspect of intellectual property rights. Those are basically international arrangements that are only applicable if there is an international element into a deal. If we are talking about uh, a foreign invested enterprise into China, let's say a joint venture or a WUFI, that is entering into a uh, licensing agreement with another Chinese company, there is no outside element to this. In other words, international law does not apply to this case. So what we have um, to protect those kind of arrangements are the uh, Chinese national laws. Okay, a great thing that has been enacted in the new foreign investment law was basically uh, a change of uh, dispositions that were previously deemed to be unfair for foreign investors. Those have been, for the most part, abolished, which is which is really incredible news and and something that is not uh, that is not really um, acknowledged from the from the part of China. Uh, article number two of the foreign investment law is is the key uh, the key article that really makes it very clear. The article number two states that um, the state, the Chinese state, shall protect the intel intellectual property right of foreign investors and foreign funded enterprises and protect the legitimate rights and interests of holders of intellectual property rights and relevant right holder. In case of any infringement of intellectual property rights, legal liability shall be investigated strictly in accordance with the law. This article is very welcomed by the uh, the foreign community into China, uh, as well as the article number 23. Um, one aspect that has been greatly improved also through this is the ownership of intellectual improvement in a joint venture, especially when there is a development aspect to it, meaning if you, for, for instance, are uh, working in the agricultural field, um, just taking an example that uh, that occurred to me uh, a few uh, a few months ago, you are a uh, foreign uh, company that is producing agricultural machinery, and you are trying to sell those into the Chinese market. Except that, uh, let's say uh, you are cultivating a specific type of plant that is uh, a certain, let's say that is uh, of a certain size and a certain type in Europe, and they have a different type that is cultivated cultivated into China. So you have to improve basically the machinery that you are going to sell into China. Now the question is, if you improve the technology uh, under the joint venture into China, who does the technology belong to? It's a great question to be asked, and something that needs to be considered very early on in the investment cycle. Under the international laws, improved technology belongs to the licensee, meaning if you improve a technology that is already existing uh, abroad and now you improve it into China, it's supposed to be belonging to 
the licensee that is improving the technology, uh, whether it is um, whether it is in a licensee agreement, um, as well as uh, under a joint venture system under the previous uh, law. Now, the Chinese contract law article number 61 uh, and the understanding of Chinese tribunals of this article makes it uh, makes it more flexible for companies to uh, actually protect improvements of technology within China. You cannot prevent a Chinese company from protecting uh, a, a developed uh, technology, let's say a developed patent, but what you can do is through contractual arrangement um, decide that you will have the uh, option to buy the technology in priority and that you can have uh, the right to access the newly improved technology before it is uh, it is protected. In other words, you can basically create contractual arrangements that will uh, protect you and give you the option of acquiring any improvement that is uh, brought by the Chinese party. Okay, regarding infringements here, we are not going to get too much into details, but bas basically previously uh, rules made so that it wasn't possible to distribute liabilities for infringement regarding licensing rights with a lot of flexibility. Now it's possible to renegotiate those uh, licensing contracts and split duties on uh, regarding the defense of IP and limiting the foreign party's liability in case of infringement by third parties that could cause a loss to uh, the Chinese licensor. Prior to that, um, it was it was uh, much more strict and, and you didn't have a lot of room for negotiation on this. Those articles, of course, uh, those new laws and new, uh, new um, dispositions, uh, legal, uh, well, let's say regulations on uh, on intellectual property are very welcome by the business community, of course. Um, now there's a general lack of confidence in the material ability for Chinese tribunals to fight back against widespread IP infringement in China, presumably by Chinese domestic companies. We hope that this law and more strict uh, penalties will allow for more uh, for more control and, and stricter uh, stricter decisions against infringement, IP infringement in particular. Uh, yeah, question remains as to whether IP protection uh, provisions in the new law will be backed up by future implementing rules and enforcement. Okay, uh, now going to concluding remarks. Um, so basically here, there are a few things that needs to be considered as I just talked about, and that's going to be the end of my presentation. Reconsidering joint ventures, uh, as I said, joint venture is not the last resort and the only recourse that you have when the negative list just uh, tells you that you cannot access one specific part of the economy. A shorter negative list uh, has been uh, published in June 2020, so this is also good news. If, you're, uh, if your uh, business has been opened up uh, it's probably the right time to jump in. The financial industry has been opening up very sharply in uh, in 2020, so we expect to see more financial institutions uh, entering into the Chinese market now, because basically uh, they have much much more freedom than than previously. Foreign loans, I talked on, uh, I touched on this uh, a little bit earlier. Leveraging intellectual property, we just covered this. Something that you must do under the new law. Three key takeaways. The reporting system, you will have to renegotiate articles of association and shareholder agreement with a plan. I'm saying with a plan because you can either wait for five years and uh, be surprised after the five years, or you can you can uh, go to your uh, Chinese partner and start dis discussing those issues now. The earlier, the better, especially because those newer rules are more um, are more protective for the foreign investor. So uh, I highly recommend that you take advantage of this and again leveraging intellectual property with more peace of mind because you have more protection under the new law and the new regime so licensing is a great way for companies to leverage their trademark if they cannot leverage the trademark themselves chinese companies are very keen on having partners uh, that are willing to um, give them the trademark and and give them basically the uh, the exposure on the chinese market when they have the means to 
distribute the product better. So this is a good marketing strategy and probably a good thing for companies that have trademarks that they don't really use and are losing speed in the Chinese market. They can basically partner with a Chinese person under a licensing agreement and leverage their IP material such as their brand or their patent. And that's the end of my presentation. Now I give the hand to Fran Francesca who will be covering uh, more practical aspects and, and and regulatory um no excuse me not regulatory at all um aspects of the of the uh of the business in in joint ventures so i'll give my hand back to um to francesca now okay Okay, uh, thank you, Quentin. Uh, okay, um, as a brief introduction, uh, my name is Francesca Scortichini. I'm an associate director at Oxford. Um, Oxford is a company specialized in providing services and advisory for inbound investments to China. We serve more than 1,000 multinational companies in different industries and provide a comprehensive package of services, including market entry advisory, corporate uh, accounting, tax and human resources, uh, as well as uh, tailor-made solutions for different needs. We have five offices in China, including Shanghai, Changshu, Beijing, Guangzhou and Shenzhen, and also in Hong Kong, Singapore, Jersey, London and Milan. OK, let's get started. Um, I'm conscious of the time, so I will run through some of the slides uh, uh, quickly. Why the due diligence and internal control are important? Um, the Chinese market is very peculiar and different from Western market, which makes the due diligence more difficult on one side, but for this reason, even more important than in the West. In order to succeed in the uh, preparation of a joint venture, it is essential to conduct a proper due diligence. It ensures that you are looking at the right deal by acquiring sufficient data um, to determine if the proposed relationship is viable and what, what will turn it into a sustainable business partnership. In addition, the due diligence would provide useful information for the negotiation process and for the design of the uh, future business strategy. In a joint venture formed uh, with an M&A deal, uh, the due diligence will also help to prepare for a smooth post-transaction uh, transaction operation. In China, due to the peculiarity of the market and the culture, um, dealing with post-joint venture issues or integration can be much more complex that, than in your home country. In order to identify the possible risks, it is important to investigate the background of the potential partner by assessing its good reputation, uh, the director's uh, senior management, uh, reliability and ethical behavior. Then looking into its financial background in order to make sure the partner is uh, financially strong and stable and has uh, enough capital and resources to invest in the venture. At the end, finding strategic synergies uh, that the venture can generate for both respective partners uh, compared to a fully owned investment. Uh, for example, um, the access to an extended and well-established distribution network or technology, patents or other intellectual property rights, common strategic and commercial interests.
companies are always different one to another. And especially between a Chinese and a foreign company, culture, systems, processes may be very different. So it's important to establish an effective internal control mechanisms to ensure the company's objectives are met. What is the purpose of the internal control? There are several. Uh, first of all, to ensure compliance with applicable law and regulations and also with internal policies. Then to carry out effective operations and ensure that any business operational financial risk is uh, well identified and managed with proper actions. To prevent and detect frauds and gross mistakes, especially when the company grows in size and complexity, the nature of such kind of risks and frauds may become diverse and sophisticated. Therefore, the company shall put in place control mechanisms to address and prevent such risks. To ensure quality of the financial reporting for both internal and external purposes. This requires the maintenance of accurate records and processes that generate a flow of timely and reliable information amongst different departments in the organization. Not only companies have to fulfill their legal obligations by submitting uh, their financial accounts to the tax bureau timely and accurately, but also they have the duty to their shareholders to produce accurate statements, which are necessary for strategic and financial planning, decision-making and monitoring of the performance. There is no uh, one size fits all internal control policy uh, because companies are all different and um, they are playing in a dynamic environment. So it shall be tailor-made, carefully designed and adapt adapted to each organization. There are three types of internal control. A preventive control which is usually the most powerful, is to prevent risks occurring. For example, <clears throat> authorization limits, segregation of duties. The second type is a detective control. Um, detective controls are to detect uh, if any problem has occurred. Um, for example, um, reconciliation, supervision, internal checks. And the last type of control is a corrective control. Uh, these are put in place once the problem has already occurred. Um, so they should be properly rectified. And for example, uh, the company can put in place a follow-up procedure and management actions. Now, I'd like to spend a few more words on the accounting and tax compliance. One of the most important functions of the internal control is to guarantee the correctness and the reliability of financial reporting for compliance reasons, obviously, but also for management and strategic purposes. When operating in China, it's important that the company is compliant with accounting and tax requirements not only to avoid penalties, liabilities, and unnecessary costs, but also, for example, to be allowed to distribute profits or make changes to the legal structure of your organization. In China, it is required to submit the financial statement and tax filing on a monthly basis. However, there are yearly compliance requirements that companies should pay special attention to. For example, the year-end financial statement um, and the annual reporting. 
It is important that companies appoint a certified auditor to check the year-end uh, financial statement. Some tax bureaus now do not require the annual audit anymore, and companies may want to avoid it to save money. Well, the audit is extremely important for directors and shareholders, as it can help to spot errors or improve the quality of the financial reporting. This shall be done every year, no later than 30 of April. The second important yearly requirement is the uh, tax reconciliation filing to be completed before the 31st of, Mar of May. In China, the profit tax generally is 25%, now reduced for companies below a certain size or operating in specific industries such as high tech. The profit tax is paid on a quarterly basis during the year. And in addition to that, companies should assess their profit tax on the overall year. As a result, companies may need to pay an additional profit tax if it has been underestimated during the year or vice versa, obtain the refund if the tax have, um, has been overpaid. Lastly, the annual reporting has to be submitted within the end of June. Uh, this has been mentioned before by Quentin, so I will not go um, in detail on this part. Failing to comply with these requirements may cause penalties, extra costs to the companies, but also direct consequences to the key individuals, the legal representative, the directors. As uh, you may know, in China, um, there is uh, uh, the social credit system um, already implemented and in place. What are the common mistakes that foreign investors do when engaging in a joint venture in China? In the past several years, WUFIs have become by far the most common uh, vehicle for foreign investment. However, may, many foreign investors still wish to enter the China market through a joint venture for many different reasons uh, as we Mm, as we saw before, maybe the specific sector is restricted or maybe there are strategic synergies between the two companies. But many investors just believe that having a Chinese partner will make things easier. Well, we had to say that, that joint ventures are complex and requires a careful management and a clear planning. Reality has proved that joint ventures sometimes result um, in a big failure when the two partners do not share common commercial and strategic interests uh, or the organization is not capable to manage and promote the integration of the two businesses. The most common mistakes done by foreign investors usually are First of all, the lack of due diligence before the signature of a joint venture agreement. Many investors do not conduct a proper due diligence regarding their potential partner and find out on a later stage that the partner can't bring the promised resources or the business are incompatible and can't generate strategic synergies. Sometimes they leave too much control to the Chinese partner only. The most common argument is that it's more efficient to allow the Chinese partner to control and be in charge of the day-to-day -day management. However, it is important for the foreign partner to be involved and exercise some form of control through a proper structure of the organization and um, internal control mechanisms. Many foreign investors are not familiar with the peculiarities of China market and leave to the local management too much freedom. 
which may result in a misunderstanding and lack of visibility on the business. Just to give you an example, <clears throat> for um, giving total control of the company's seals to the local staff. In China, the company's seal is used to validate official documents, and a document affixed with company seal becomes official, legally binding for the company. So you can understand how easy it could be to misuse the company seals if not properly secured. Or it's a common belief that in China, the accounting method is cash basis. This is not true, but the, in the accounting practice at time, it's, uh, it's possible that um, the international standards are not met um, with a reasonable level of detail. Another example is that the practice of um, doing cash transactions through personal accounts, Alipay or WeChat, and using fake invoices as a common method to extract cash from the company. Another common mistake is the conflict management style. Foreign investors usually assume that a Sino-foreign joint venture is managed according to a common Western model, under which a board of directors has the control of their, over the company. So the foreign investor may mistakenly believe that having 50% ownership of the shares gives them control, um, control of the company. Then they allow the Chinese partner to choose the key management positions of the legal structure. By doing so, they will give effective power to the partner. On the other hand, the partner may argue that they cannot use Mm, their connections unless uh, their people act as uh, representatives. Another common mistake is the um, cultural differences uh, um, that lead to miscommunication and the confrontation between partners. Understanding the cultural environment is essential and critical to the success of the joint venture. It is also wrong for the foreign investor to impose its management, um, his management style, view, culture, or an excessive limitation to the local management, as it is important to adapt to the local culture. Last, the mismanagement of the resources may lead to inefficiencies, higher expenditures, and cost. Anyway, there are also many examples of a successful joint venture in China, and I would like to briefly introduce two cases, the Shanghai Disney Resort and the Beijing uh, SKP shopping mall. Shanghai Disney's, Disney Resort is a joint venture between the Walt Disney Company and the Shanghai Shandy Group, holding 43 and 75% of the shares, respectively. Shanghai Shandy Group is a new type of functional state-owned enterprise, mainly established to deal with the joint venture in charge of the development and construction construction of the Shanghai Disney Resort. What are the key factor, uh, factor of success in this joint venture? Each party as members of the joint venture contributes specialized expertise and knowledge. Uh, for example, Shandy Group um, contributed the influential power to obtain land concessions, construction permit, access um, to a convenient location, and also to bank financing. In addition to that, um, 
it contributes the knowledge of the local market uh, and um, um, involvement in innovation and development of many unique projects. On the other side, Walt Disney Company brings the advantage of one of the most powerful and well-known brands in the world, Disney. It's a unique and innovative operation model and a well-established experience in managing parks, amusement parks. Another successful joint venture in China is um, SKP Beijing a luxury shopping center, which is embracing a mix of technology, art, and fashion to attract uh, young customers and win the competition of uh, the more and more consolidated e-commerce model. Founded in uh, 2007, SKP Beijing is currently hold uh, by for 60% by a Singapore company, Radiance Investment Holding, and um, for 40% by Beijing Walian Group Holding. <clears throat> the shopping mall had 15.3 billion RMB revenue and um, in 2019, being the most successful and productive retailer shopping mall in China and in the world after Harrods. What are the key factors of success? Well, Beijing Hualian Group uh, business is uh, primarily focused on uh, hypermarkets, uh, supermarkets, department store and commercial properties bringing a rich experience in operating retail businesses, but also economic financial strength and market influence. The other side has contributed the brand value, a well-known high-end retail brand and innovative and marketing, marketing development strategies um, through combination of art, art and technology. In these cases, differently from, joint, from Woofies, the joint venture vehicle has combined the expertise and strength of each party and therefore um, determining the success of the company. In conclusion, the main takeaways for foreign investors willing to start their business in China are, first of all, to understand what is the best way to enter this market. If the joint venture is the most suitable, then take time to find the right partner through a comprehensive due diligence process and strategic planning. Think about uh, what you and your partner want to accomplish with the joint venture. Who will make the business decisions? Who will control the operations? Who, will, um, who and what will contribute now and in the future? Capital, know-how, technology. Eventually also think about uh, how you will resolve disputes and exit the joint venture. Second, to choose carefully the corporate governance structure and have the power to appoint and remove the joint ventures legal representative, the general managers, in order to keep visibility on business operations. Then to establish an effective control, internal control mechanisms. And uh, for example, control over the company's job, secure the right to appoint the finance manager or a professional accounting service provider and the auditor. It is important to establish a solid and a reliable financial reporting system and information flow or having a service provider reviewing the financial of your company. Lastly, Always be diligent and pay attention to details. Be aware of each step of the joint venture establishment, the financial situation, who keeps the bank tokens, who has the power and authority to do what. 
Okay, this is the end of my presentation. It's now time for the Q&A session. Uh, please feel free to send your questions through the chat box or reach, us, uh, reach um, out to us later for more information. There are no questions, so we can conclude here our webinar. Um, thanks again, everybody, for participating, and um, please feel free to uh, contact us, both uh, uh, myself and Quentin, for any question related to uh, the topic of this presentation or uh, any other information that uh, you wish to receive uh, on uh, your um, market entry um, project into China. Thank you again, everybody.